When it comes to wrestling, 2001 is not one of those years that I look back on very fondly. It just isn't. Now, certainly, there were great matches, memorable moments that happened in the year 2001 in WWF. But that was the problem. As 2001 went along, it was basically at that point just WWF. And going back and watching many of the shows from this year, you know, don't bring up warm and fuzzy feelings for me. They don't bring up positive emotions or feelings. They don't. They remind me of just how much this time really sucked, how much I hated this year of wrestling, how much this year really impacted the way I viewed wrestling in a lot of ways, and how much negative was truly done to the business of wrestling in 2001. Yeah. So when I go back and watch a show like King of the Ring 2001, like, I'm certainly not going to be glowing in my praise of it. It doesn't mean in its own bubble that it wasn't like an okay or decent show. In a bubble, it probably was. Like when you look at the two semifinal King of the Ring matches, like you had Kurt Angle versus Christian and Edge versus Rhino. This is a de decent pool of talent for a King of the Ring tournament for your Final Four. And that time, back in 2001, you damn right it was. Like it was a really, like Kurt Angle was a former WWF champion, prior year's King of the Ring winner. You know, Edge and Christian, part of one of the hot tag teams of the Attitude Era. Rhino was a guy of some no notoriety from his ECW time. Like, you look at these guys and you're sitting there saying, you know, man, there's some good talent in this King of the Ring. Kurt Angle and Christian had a pretty good match. Although, it was Shane McMahon that got involved. And with Paul Heyman on commentary, that was weird because it wasn't the King at that point. It was Paul Heyman and JR doing commentary, if you remember, at this point in time in 2001. And throughout the night, as they're making references to our Ben Juan... Jericho going to go over to WCW if they win the title or is Austin going over to WCW or what's going to happen with WCW and all this other crap. Like all these bad memories flushing through my mind. The thing of like, oh, why would Shane McMahon help Kurt Angle win? Why would he want him to go advance to the King of the Ring final? It's like, oh my God, it's so obvious. Like even watching it now, it makes immediate sense. Like, of course, Shane McMahon would want Kurt Angle to go to the King of the Ring final because they had a street fight later on in the night. He wants Kurt Angle to have two other matches before the street fight, not just one. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> so, um, but Kurt Angle and Edge won their matches, which led to them facing off at the King of the Ring final, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, the Dudley boys took on Kane and Spike Dudley. The thought here was Spike Dudley was mad at the Dudleys and mad at them for messing with Molly Holly. They, he was going to find somebody, a uh, surprise a partner to team up against them to try and challenge for the tag team championships. They brought in Kane. Didn't matter. Dudley Boys, LOL, win. Solid match, though, nonetheless. And you go back in 2001, like, this talent roster was really, really good. And some of the things they were doing, some of the characters they were had were really good. Some of the stories were pretty good, but, god damn, I still hate this year so freaking much. Uh, the King of the Ring final involved Edge and Kurt Angle. This looked like it was certainly going to be Edge's big moment. It was certainly an announcement to him that he had arrived or he was somebody that the company was vi envisioning for future single star success, which was certainly appropriate at that time. Like how they were playing out the fact that, especially later in the night, Christian came out during this match and then later on he went up to Edge and he's like, hey, just so you know, like I was out there to help you. And Edge is like, well, of course you were. Why else would you have been out there? Um, but... When you look at the actual King of the Ring tournaments themselves, like this is one of the better ones in terms of talent, in terms of the actual matches, like this was pretty good. Um, then you had the light heavyweight championship match between Jeff Hardy and X-Pac. Jeff Hardy retains his championship. Decent match, probably could have win a few more minutes between these two guys, honestly. But, you know, you're starting to look at guys like Edge and looking at guys like Jeff Hardy. This is what the tag team division used to be. Sometimes you have tag teams that were just great tag teams and that's where they needed to be. 
But then you also had those guys that were part of tag teams that you said, hey, we want to do the tag team thing for a while, but we're doing that to teach them, develop them, and grow them, and help them connect. And then eventually, we're using that as a springboard and a platform to become singles guys here, where they're already starting to think about those next phases of career for guys like Edge and for Jeff Hardy. And they were doing a pretty good job of it at the time. Uh, one of the things that was really aggravating going back and watching the show was all the stuff involving Diamond Dallas Page. And him being the one he had just recently revealed, if you remember on Raw, came into the ring and took off the mask. And he's the Sarah Stalker. He's the one stalking Undertaker's wife. Which was just so ridiculous at that time to anybody that remembers. Because everybody remembers what Kim Kimberly Page used to look, look like at that time. That was DDP's wife. Like, why the fuck would he be walking, sitting there and stalking Sarah? Like, it was just dumb. It was such a dumb way to bring in somebody who previously had been a fan favorite in WCW like DDP. Like it was one of those things of WWF is the only sandbox in town now, so we're going to do whatever the fuck we want with these guys. We're going to use them because we might as well, but we're going to do it our way. And this was just trash. And you know, the, the, the way that they incorporated DDP throughout the whole night, like was all, that itself was well done, but then it leading to the whole thing of you know, Sarah's actually recording DDP coming into the arena, and then here comes Taker, and Taker beats down DDP until DDP takes off. Like, it's just a reminder of how this whole angle was stupid and how it ultimately led to DDP getting buried by Undertaker and WWF, and it fucking sucked. And should have been a foreshadowing of the diarrhea that was going to come in terms of the invasion angle, which was just starting to really become a thing at this point. It was just starting to kind of manifest and take hold here. Um, the best match of the night, obviously, and the match that everybody remembers, the match that has the iconic imagery two decades later of Kurt Angle throw, suplex in Shane through the King of the Ring um, sign and having all that sign shatter. It's this match. It's Kurt Angle versus Shane McMahon in a street fight. I, this is legendary. Like This is iconic. This is on the very best of... Um, King of the Ring match DVDs. It has to be. Like it says it holds up as well as any of them. It holds up two decades later. Like these two guys went out there and had a believable street fight and beat the holy fuck out of each other. They absolutely did. Like one of the more brutal spots that you'll see is that first time when Kurt tried to suplex Shane into the thing and it didn't break and then it looked like Shane came down like on kind of the back of the top of his fucking head. Like that shit could have paralyzed him. They're like, ah, we're gonna do it again. Reset, bam, and they did it. Like it was bleak, it was fucking bloody, it was brutal, it was 100% believable. And this in and of itself, in this pocket, was certainly great to go back and watch. Once I ignore the fact that at this time Shane was being presented as the owner of WCW, and what was going to be next for WCW, and all this other bullshit. It was just, sick. And then we get to the main event, and one of the big talking points throughout the night, as I referenced a couple of moments ago, was that, you know, the winner of this match, were they going to abandon WWF and then where they're going to take the WWF championship and move it over to WCW was Bar Benoit going to do that was Jericho going to do that what was going to happen with Stone Cold was Vince actually going to show up he wanted Vince to be there he needed Vince to be there this is when this was stupid shit it's like fucking Austin as a heel who the hell wants to see that it was trash and everybody goddamn good and well knows it it sucked and this match was kind of ugh. The fans were kind of into it at different points in time, but not like you would maybe expect from the level of talent that was truly in this match. You know, obviously, the big moment in this match was the appearance of Booker T, who came out and attacked Stone Cold Steve Austin. Um, you know, that was, oh my God, it's Booker T, it's the WCW champion! What the hell are they doing here? You know, back when the commentators used to have passion and excitement for what the hell they did, and they tried to sell the importance of the mag magnitude or significance of the moment by actually having inflection in their voice that we don't get anymore. But of course, it was more like business as usual, and again, should have been a foreshadowing of things to come with the whole diarrhea that was the invasion angle. Because Booker T came out and attacked Stone Cold Steve Austin, left Stone Cold Steve Austin laying, and let, lo and behold, what do you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin ended up retaining in this triple threat and still being the WWF champion. Of course, soon after this, originally the next pay-per-view, like when you're going back and watching Kick of the Ring 2001, they're originally advertising and promoted the fully loaded pay-per-view, which would go on to then quickly have its name changed to the 
Invasion pay-per-view. And this is really the pay-per-view that truly kind of like started kick-starting us down that full invasion path, which led to the rest of the abomination and abortion that was 2001 Invasion Angle WWF, which is some of the worst shit that I have ever seen. It is. Like, for those that like matches and spots and extreme moments, they, they love this crap. For the younger crowd that grew up in this time, they're going to love this crap. For those like me and older, we know that even with the occasional highlight or big moment sprinkled in, that this time was trash. I much prefer 2002 WWE, even though that was the year that they got the F out. Like, it's just funny going back and watching 2001 again. Like It's the last full year that they had the WWF name. They hadn't gotten the F out yet, because when they got the F out, it seemed like all the fun went with it. Um, you know, so I don't think the triple threat, I don't like triple threat match in, matches in general. I don't think this triple threat match was all that outstanding. The Kurt Angle, Shane McMahon street fight absolutely is worth going back and watching again. But you could probably, again, miss the most of the rest of this show. Although the King of the Ring tournament, the participants, the matches were a little bit better, certainly, than some of the other years. You know, it's just when you get to the point of, like, you're doing all this crap with a heel DDP, and, you know, you got American badass taker, like, who the freaking hell wants to see that? So, yeah. It's a King of the Ring tournament that has one iconic match that you should absolutely go back and watch, and you can feel comfortable with skipping most of the rest of the show. Um, now, we've got one more of these to do. Mercifully, thank the Lord. Can't wait to talk about the last of this King of the Ring pay-per-view series and get this done forever. Next up, we'll talk about the 2002 King of the Ring and the next big thing, Brock Lesnar!